Hi, I'm Dr. John Emil Kinney, and welcome to my first installation of a, hopefully a series of lectures that I'll be sharing with you on this website. This is basically uh, an introduction to myself and uh, a summary of the first four chapters of uh, what I hope to become a concise clinical handbook for interested uh, medical students, residents, and fellows um, who uh, are interested in um, heart-lung interaction and, and why, they're, why it's clinically relevant. Um, just a little bit about myself. I, did, uh, I went to medical school at the University of Toronto. Um, I really first became interested in intensive care medicine rounding in the Toronto General ICU. Um, and this uh, interest continued on uh, during my residency at NYU uh, and chief residency there as well. Uh, and now I'm fortunate to be at Stanford University where I'm uh, just finishing up my, my fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine. So, it's hard to find good physiology teaching. I have found this for the last seven years of my postgraduate training. Uh, it can be sporadic, some people who know it quite well, there's some people who don't, and I would like to consolidate all the information that I've gleaned because this is really truly my passion um, from primary resources from really giants in this world like Mike Pinsky and Sheldon Magder and the late Saul Permutt and uh, James Robotham and the list goes on and on um, you know in terms of the, the people who have contributed to this body of literature. Some of it is very difficult to understand and it's complicated and confusing and then other resources I found are very simple and are sort of at a very basic um, first-year medical student level. And I want to try and bridge the gap with these lectures in this written volume. I want to make um, cardiopulmonary physiology clinically relevant and clinically meaningful and give the physician at the bedside uh, the knowledge to make an educated guess as to um, what is going on in a patient's thorax in terms of pressures and volumes and flow. That's why I am doing this. Um, it is also my bias that today in medicine, it's all, it's all about molecular, molecular medicine. All the grants, all the research money, for the most part, is going to genes and gene expression and proteomics and all these really cool things, but um, honestly, when you're at the patient's bedside who has got terrible ARDS, their peak and plateau pressures are high, they're hypotensive, they have an ejection fraction of 15%, their CVP is reading 20, they've got wide open tricuspid regurgitation, you're getting a thermodilution cardiac index of 1.8, and you're trying to figure out if the patient needs fluids, if they need diuresis, um, you're trying to figure out when you're ultrasounding their IVC and you're seeing it collapsing what exactly that means, that is much more important to the intensivist than understanding the cytokine expression pattern of sepsis. Again, that's my humble opinion. So, what I'm trying to say is we practice physiology-based medicine rather than evidence-based medicine. The latter is very good, but the former, I feel, is just an important. The teaching of physiology in the ICU has been sporadic, and I want to bring it together into one website and one book that is meaningful to the reader and the viewer. It's very important today with the advent of these pocket echocardiograms and implementation of newer, physio uh, newer physiologic uh, monitoring devices such as pulse pressure variation. And I'm a little bit worried that this new physiology, this, um, for example, this uh, pulse pre all these new pulse pressure variation monitors are, is going to be applied too broadly and without uh, a real knowledge of what that um, pulse pressure is telling you. And in some respects, in 10 or 20 years, uh, once we start to truly realize the limitations of these devices, they may go the way of the pulmonary artery catheter, because perhaps some might say the pulmonary art artery catheter was applied in a similar manner. That is, it was um, 
introduced by Dr. Swan and Gans in the early 70s, and then it just kind of exploded, and people were using pulmonary artery catheters, catheters without a real intimate knowledge of what the data they were giving you really truly meant. And as a result, I think um, the, the use of pulmonary artery catheters has waned because they weren't this magic silver bullet that everyone wanted them to be. And I also think animated lectures are helpful when it comes to teaching, and that's why I've put these lectures all up on this website free of charge for everyone to love and appreciate and share with their friends and, and talk amongst themselves at the water coolers and whatnot. So the book and the lecture series will be divided into two general parts. The first four chapters will be clinically relevant physiology. Um, and then this, the first four chapters will um, have an emphasis placed on graphical representation of these systems. The Campbell diagram pertaining to the pulmonary system and the Guyton diagram pertaining to the cardiovascular system. And then I think a novel combination of the two which helps really integrate heart-lung interaction in a meaningful way. After the first four chapters, um, hopefully you will have a tremendous appreciation for these interrelationships, and then uh, the second portion of the, of the book and the lectures, chapters five through eight, will then um, be dedicated to more clinically relevant topics. So what are the chapters? Well, here's the first four, and here's the second four. So, welcome. Here are some highlights of chapters one through four. Chapter one, the mechanics of ventilation. So I'm going to introduce or reintroduce the Campbell diagram. Here it is. The Campbell diagram is um, the superimposition of the elastance or compliance curves. Elastance and compliance are inverse of each other, so physiologists tend to use them interchangeably. Uh, so this is the elastance curve for the lungs. This is the elastance curve for the passive chest wall, that is the chest wall with, without any activation of the muscles of inspiration or expiration. It's like chest wall diastole. And the intersection of the two, as you may know, is a functional residual capacity. You can also see that there's a difference in the equilibrium volume. That is, if you were to let, here's the x-axis, this is pleural pressure or I will use interchangeably throughout my talks as intrathoracic pressure. If you were to let pleural pressure reach atmospheric pressure, which is um, on this reference system zero, the lungs will collapse, but not all the way down to a volume. Again, y-axis is volume in percent vital capacity. They will collapse down to a, small, a smaller volume than FRC, but not completely to zero, and that is because the equilibrium volume of the lungs, there is gas trapped within uh, the lungs, and there's always a little bit of a positive volume. And if you were to increase um, intrathoracic pressure above atmospheric pressure, you would simply just collapse the airways, and the volume would not be expelled. Okay, this is FRC, where they intersect. Um, and one last point is the equilibrium volume of the chest wall is up here. It's actually much higher than functional residual capacity. So to get to FRC, the lungs are actually expanded a little, and the chest wall is actually compressed a little. So that means when you're in the operating room and you see the surgeons cut open the sternum to perform uh, bypass surgery or an open heart surgery, you will see what? You'll see the chest wall expand outwards towards its equilibrium volume, and you will see the lungs recoil inwards to, um, towards its equilibrium volume. Okay, now let's talk about what happens when you want to increase the volume of the thorax, say from functional residual capacity to half of vital capacity. And for all intents and purposes, this is like a normal tidal volume breath in a patient uh, with normal lungs and chest wall. While the muscles of inspiration are activated, the pleural pressure will reduce from functional residual capacity to the point along the pulmonary elastance curve that reaches your new higher lung volume. So let's see what this cartoon looks like. Well, you're going to move from here to here, and now your pleural pressure has gone from, say, negative 5 centimeters of water to negative 8 to 10 centimeters of water, and you've increased your 
uh, thoracic volume to this higher level that is now 50% vital capacity. So the pleural pressure is decreased, thoracic volume is increased, and this is an um, po important point which is talked about very extensively in chapter one. This is a pressure change needed only to affect volume change. This um, pressure change says absolutely nothing about gas flow. So it may seem a little artificial, but as you'll see in chapter one, there are two distinct kinds of um, pressure um, when it comes to the mechanics of ventilation. And the first type is a static pressure, and that's the pressure required just to affect a volume. And that's what's illustrated here. Um, this would be like taking a breath in, holding it, and then measuring the pressure that's required to maintain that new volume. It is saying nothing about gas flow. Okay? And what uh, can also be confusing is that You've moved to this new volume here, but the chest wall elastance curve that's depicted here is the passive chest wall elastance curve, essentially a paralyzed or inactive chest wall elastance curve. And that tends to confuse people how you can have this curve illustrated when it's passive, but you're actively changing the volume. And what's really kind of happening here, and this animation isn't completely correct, but during an inspiration, the chest wall elastance curve is actually changing as the muscles of inspiration are activated. The um, compliance curve of the chest wall does change um, and it sort of intersects at this new higher volume and then you would hold it and then on expiration it would then return back to FRC. And the slope of this curve doesn't exactly remain like this S shape as it changes during inspiration. It actually becomes a little bit more curvilinear, but this is just for illustrative purposes. Okay, now it's key that it's the pressure difference between the passive chest wall elastance curve and the pulmonary elastance curve. It's this pressure difference, this lateral difference, remember pressure is on the x-axis here, that represents the amount of pressure that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration to change this volume. Again, this is volume only. This is a static pressure. This is saying nothing about gas flow at this time. Okay, and that's represented, this pressure uh, requirement is represented by this lateral arrow, this orange arrow here. Moving on to the dynamic aspects of uh, ventilation, um, you can see here on the Campbell diagram that <clears throat> this loop here, this additional line to the left of the static pulmonary elastance curve, this represents the amount of pleural pressure, or the amount of pressure that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration to drive gas flow. So this is in addition to what we just talked about, which is the pressure required to maintain a given lung volume. And uh, you can see here that the cur this curve here compared to this curve here would represent uh, an increased airways re resistance, um, which may be due to you know, asthma, a chronic bronchitic, an emphysematous patient. It could be due to an increase in turbulent gas flow, um, as I describe more in detail in chapter one, where um, when the gas flow pattern is turbulent, it requires a greater pressure differential to generate any given flow. So that's uh, demonstrated by that curve there. And again, just to reiterate, um, at this given volume, here on the y-axis comparing these two patients, um, the, the pleural pressure dedication to uh, gas flow is less in patient A versus patient B. So zooming in on this portion of the Campbell diagram, um, I want to demonstrate or reiterate uh, what I've just explained and I want to do it with this kind of color coding and I want to emphasize that throughout my lectures um, in the introduction here and in, in the um, specific chapters themselves that I try and color code everything and throughout chapter one when I'm referring to dynamic or static pressure uh, the dynamic is represented by red and the static is represented by blue and so you can see this is FRC and this is your new lung volume, say after a tidal inspiration. And you can see that as time progresses, there is differing amounts of um, 
of the pleural pressure, the intrathoracic pressure, remember that it's the intrathoracic pressure on the x-axis here, there's differing amounts as the inspiratory breath proceeds that's dedicated to gas flow, which is the red or the portion to the left of this curve, versus static lung volume, which is the blue, um, and that is on the right portion of the pulmonary elastance curve. So as you go from FRC initially, most if not all of the um, pleural pressure changes dedicated to dynamic um, uh, the dynamic component of, of inspiration and then as you proceed to end inspiration once gas flow has ceased there is no more pressure that is dedicated to gas flow and it's essentially all dedicated to maintaining lung volume. So expiration is normally passive so the expiratory limb is contained within this triangle here and as we talk about in more detail in chapter one this triangle here outlines the the area of this triangle outlines the amount of total work that the muscles of inspiration must, must uh, generate to change thoracic volume from FRC to this new volume. So the work that is um, done on a passive expiration will be contained with this on contained within this envelope because essentially once you've inspired you have a certain amount of potential energy stored in uh, pulmonary elastic recoil and then that potential energy is then transferred or, or transitioned into a kinetic energy during expiration. So you'll see that here. This is the expiratory loop. But as you know, um, patients don't always passively expire, particularly patients that you see in the intensive care unit or in the emergency department or on the floor who are very short of breath or an extremis and they grunt and bear down and recruit muscles of expiration and can generate very positive intrathoracic pressures on, on expiration. So such a patient would be illustrated by this curve here and this envelope would actually, the area of this envelope would define the work of breathing for a forced expiration and the pleural pressure would be um, more positive in this patient to generate um, gas flow. Okay. So that was the patient who was spontaneously breathing. So how does this, how does the Campbell diagram relate to a patient who's mechanically ventilated? Well, there is a relationship and it, and it can be derived from the relative positions of the lung elastance curve and the chest wall elastance curve. So Recall that under conditions of no airflow, uh, at any given thoracic volume, it's this distance between these two curves that is the pressure that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration to maintain that volume. Again, not talking about gas flow. Well, you could say the exact same thing about the ventilator. If, if the muscles must generate X pressure to maintain a volume, well, then the ventilator must apply the same amount of pressure at the proximal trachea to achieve that and maintain that volume. So now on the x-axis here, instead of intrathoracic pressure, this is now airway pressure that the ventilator is applying to maintain a volume. Okay, so it's a key change in your um, x-axis here. And this is what I just said, that the pressure must be applied by the ventilator to the proximal trachea. So you can kind of make a graph here that at this volume, it's the pressure difference between the lung and the chest wall elastance curve that must be generated by the muscles of inspiration or by the ventilator. So the same amount of pressure applied at the proximal trachea to obtain this volume. So this would be like generating a series of static pressures or a series of plateau pressures for those of you who are familiar with um, ventilatory parlance. Uh, mechanical ventilatory parlance and so you could just graph these out and you can see that this then forms a line of the um, static pressure uh, of the respiratory system okay when I say respiratory system throughout my talks the respiratory system reply uh, the respiratory system implies the lung and the chest wall together so this curve then is a compliance curve of the respiratory system. This would be a series of plateau pressures generated off of the, the ventilator. Okay.
Um, so this is the elastance or compliance curve of the respiratory system or the lung and chest wall. And just for a recap, what a static or a plateau pressure is on the ventilator. So if this is, again, airway pressure on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. If you're looking at these pressure-time relationships on a ventilator, you have your peak pressure here. Um, and then what you can do is you can apply an end inspiratory hold when the patient is passive with the ventilator. You hold pressure at the end of inspiration and then you get this new pressure. This is your plateau pressure, or the static pressure. This is, again, you've removed airflow from the equation and you are assessing the amount of pressure that must be applied at the proximal trachea just to maintain a volume. And that's essentially what we just saw in the last slide, the amount of pressure um, to attain a given volume of the respiratory system. And the respiratory system, again, when you're ventilated, includes the lung and the chest wall together. This is your static pressure. Um, so this, the static pressure is the pressure required to maintain a thoracic volume in the absence of airflow. It's therefore related to the compliance of the respiratory system. And just um, for interest's sake, the slope of this line from onset of inspiration to the pressure here, the static pressure, this slope, interestingly enough, uh, approximate the com approximates the compliance of the respiratory system. Okay. So what, what's the difference between um, plateau pressure, pleural pressure, and peak pressure? Well, this graph will um, help uh, illuminate these differences, okay? So the compliance curve of the chest wall approximates um, the pleural pressure uh, or the intrathoracic pressure in a patient who is um, sedated, and, and may be paralyzed, so there's absolutely no um, there's absolutely no contribution from the muscles of inspiration at all. So the pleural pressure follows the chest wall elastance curve, and this is a key point here. And you can sort of think of why that would be in a patient who's who's heavily sedated and paralyzed on the ventilator. The ventilator is pushing air into the proximal trachea. That proximal trachea is, or that pressure is then used to expand the lungs, and then the lungs are pressing out against the chest wall, and it's that compression of the lungs against the chest wall that determines your pleural pressure, okay? And the pleural, so the pleural pressure will be determined largely by the, um, the chest wall elastance curve here. So if you were to obtain a plateau pressure in this particular patient, the static pressure of the respiratory system would fall on this curve here. This is the respiratory system elastance curve. It would fall here, okay? At this volume, the pleural pressure would actually be here. This would be the pleural pressure about here because it's following the chest wall elastance curve. And then this additional curve to the right here, this is the dynamic aspect of, inch, of, of airway pressure that the ventilator must overcome for airways resistance. So that would define your peak pressure. So again, there's the approximate pleural pressure at this volume. And then if you had a patient with increased airways resistance, their peak pressure would fall out here. So you, this is a key point that you must understand the difference between uh, the peak pressure, the plateau pressure, and the pleural pressure, they can be very different. And there tends to be this assumption or this misunderstanding amongst, you know, a lot of the house staff who I meet that, that the pressure that you're pulling off of the, or you're measuring off of the ventilator at the proximal trachea somehow is equivalent to the pleural pressure, and it's not at all. Um, the pressure uh, at the proximal trachea will be um, variably transmitted to the pleural space and that will be dependent upon um, the relative compliances of the lung and the chest wall together. So that's the overview of chapter one and uh, if you're interested I strongly suggest that you tune in for the introduction for all of my other chapters because you are going to love them.